Start a Therapy Practice Podcast, episode number 17. Try not. Do or do not. There is no try. Henry Ford of Ford Motor Company fame once said, It has been my observation that most people get ahead during the time that others waste. This is so true. Each one of us can spend our time a little more wisely. And in this podcast today, I want to help you spend your time better. To get more out of your day, to achieve more freedom in your life, more margin in your time, and to do more of what you want to do. My name is Scott Harmon, and I'm an occupational therapist, and my wife and I own two private practice clinics. I started this podcast because I wanted to help other private practitioners or those therapists who want to be private practitioners jump the learning curve and to make less mistakes in their endeavor to start and run a private practice. Now, I'm so into productivity that I've been excited about doing this specific episode. I spend a lot of time thinking about time. I want to maximize my time and work smarter and not harder. I'm at a point in my life where I desire to spend more time with my family and less time doing busy work. Time is precious. Don't waste it. Harness it and make time work for you. So before I go any further, I want to thank you for listening. I really appreciate everybody stopping by the website and downloading my free stuff. I really appreciate those who have purchased my ebook, Start and Run a Therapy Practice. I appreciate the questions that I've received recently and the ratings that I've received on iTunes and Stitcher. Now, I love reading about productivity tips so much that I want to get yours. So go by the website, startatherapypractice.com, go to episode number 17, which is this episode. In the comments section, leave your best productivity tip, and then I will choose from those who leave a comment to win a free copy of my ebook, Start and Run a Therapy Practice. But you must leave a comment in the comments section on this post, episode number 17. After May 23rd of 2014, I will choose a winner to receive a free copy of my ebook. So be sure to go by the website and put your comment for a productivity tip in there before May 23rd. I also want to congratulate Bryn Rhodes. She won a free copy of my ebook over at activitytaylor.com. Now, Kim Taylor, who runs activitytaylor.com, was on podcast episode number 10. Kim did a review of my ebook at activitytaylor.com. And I will put a link in the show notes to that review. From the comments, Kim picked a winner to re receive a free copy of my ebook, and Bryn won that copy. I think that's so cool because Bryn has corresponded with me through email, and she's starting up a private practice. So it was a perfect win for her. So excited for Bryn. Now, whether you currently have a private practice or just now starting to think about starting a private practice, you'll want to have a copy of my ebook. So go by the comment section and leave a comment with your best productivity tip. Now, as the title of this podcast episode mentions, productivity is the secret sauce to get ahead in life and in marketing of your private practice. Productivity is that foundation, that underpinning of your life and of your private practice that will get you ahead. Your goal with your private practice and in life should not be to work 100 hours per week. Each of us goes into private practice in order to deliver our services in a better way to have more control over our schedule and over our therapy. But our goal should not be to work 100 hours per week. Walt Disney once said, A man should never neglect his family for business. During the first few years of my private practice, there were many, many days that I would work 12, 14, 16-hour days. The benefit there was my wife was working alongside me and my kids were usually at the clinic with us. But those were long days. And in the beginning, you might have to do that. You might have to spend 12 plus hours working on your private practice, but it should not be the goal. The goal should be to work less, to work smarter, not harder. Now, for me, this required an extreme shift in perspective. For my public school days and in my previous eight to five job, I was trained for years to be at work, to producing, to seeing units, to seeing clients. And in my job working for the man, it was basically making as much money for that institution as I could. The goal is not necessarily to provide excellent therapy, although they did want us to do that. But the ultimate goal was to see as many clients as we possibly could. Guess what this causes? Burnout. My wife was telling me yesterday that she had read a survey that therapists 
have the highest amount of burnout or dissatisfaction with their career, even more so than nurses, other healthcare professionals, lawyers, doctors, therapists at a higher dissatisfaction rate. We were trying to figure that out. I could not put my finger on it because those other professions work super hard. But why is that for therapists? I would love to know your thoughts on that. So leave that in the comments section along with your productivity tip. Why therapists, more than other professions, experience a higher rate of burnout and dissatisfaction with their career choice? I think that is so unfortunate because I love my career. Now, I'm not sure I could have said that as much when I was working for the man. But now, I really, really love what I do. Now, sometimes I continue to struggle with the idea that I need to be at work from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, treating as many clients as I can or doing some sort of busy type paperwork. When I'm not doing those things, I often feel guilty that I should be because there's a lot of people that are. This calls for an extreme shift in perspective. The truth is, at my private practice, I can be more productive when I'm not there a lot of times. Obviously, sometimes I have to be there if I'm doing treatment or if I need to talk to my therapist or to my staff, I have to be there. And I have to be there also to talk to clients and just to manage the day-to-day. -day. But often I don't have to be there, and I can work on my clinic instead of working in my clinic. This was an extreme shift in perspective for me, and I'm still getting used to that. Now, whether you have one private practice client or 500 private practice clients, you must continually assess your productivity. It's not like the infomercial you've seen, set it and forget it. You must attend continually to your productivity. Don't set it and forget it. It also helps if you can have someone who can give you honest feedback into your productivity, into your scheduling, into how you operate things. My wife is a great asset in this respect. She will give me honest feedback because she knows my schedule or she'll ask about it or she'll just look at it on the computer because I have it on my computer. She will give me honest feedback and let me know, hey, you might do this a little bit better. You might do this a little bit different. You're wasting your time over here. You need to schedule this over here. Honest feedback from someone is a huge asset because often you don't have the perspective that you need in order to tweak your scheduling, to, to change your productivity and the way you do things. You must also be humble enough to take that advice who, from the person who is giving it. Often we think we're doing it the best way and the only way that it should be done, when truly it could be done better. It could be done faster. It could be done more efficiently. Be humble enough to take that advice. Another part of productivity that is not directly productivity, but it does affect our life and our private practice, you must constantly be learning. You have not arrived. You have not received that diploma of knowing everything constantly be learning. You should be reading books and listening to podcasts, listening to audiobooks about business, about productivity, and about life. You need to ask others about the tools and the systems that they use. Other small businesses are often insightful in this area. They don't have to be a medical business or a therapy business. It can be any small business owner. Talk shop with these business owners. The Chamber of Commerce in your local community is a great place to do this. And there are plenty of good books out there on productivity and how to operate your business. But the overarching important idea is that time is precious and you must harness and control and maximize your time. That should always be in the front of your mind. In this episode, I'm going to give you very specific practical tips, some websites and some tools. Now, any websites or tools that I mention, I will put a link in the show notes. So you will definitely want to go over to startatherapypractice.com to get those links. Before I give you the specific tools that I use that I recommend, I want to give you some philosophical thoughts on productivity. These philosophical thoughts are all ideas that we intuitively know. As the saying goes, often we need to be reminded of what we already know instead of learning something new. You are an entrepreneur or you're an inspiring entrepreneur. You have the mindset of, if that person over there can do it, I can do it too. You saw another therapist in private practice or learned about a private practice and you thought, well, if that person can do it, I know I can do it. You didn't think, oh, well, that person's just lucky or they're especially gifted by God. You know that if you put in enough hard work, research, and effort, you also can do private practice. That's why you're listening to this podcast. And your attitude inspires me and motivates me to do this podcast. I hope to inspire you to be the hope of the future and not its demise. 
As a child of God, we each have a duty to be hope and light. Did you ever stop to think that you may be obligated to start a private practice? You may have a calling to start and run a private practice. Did you have a similar thought when you made the decision to become a therapist? Well, this is what I'm supposed to do. Maybe, also, you're supposed to have a private practice. If you already have a private practice, I would definitely say that you're called to run that private practice to the best of the ability you, that you have. So don't fall short. Don't neglect your responsibilities and your obligation, especially if you believe this is your true calling. Now, when you were working for the man, you probably wanted to escape the questionable practice, the day-to-day -day grind. You wanted more flexibility in your schedule. And that's what led you to the thoughts of starting a private practice. Whether you're still working for the man or working for yourself, you must harness time. You must have a shift in perspective. Now, I want you to listen closely. You are in the service business. Me too. I consider it a great honor to serve you and to assist you to start a therapy practice, just as I consider it a great honor to serve my clients and to serve my family. Pope John Paul II, who will be declared a saint this month, his favorite title was the Servant of the Servants of God. He considered himself a servant of all of the followers of God. This should be our attitude also. We are the servants of our clients, of our family, of our community, of God, and of anyone who is placed in our path. This is the shift in perspective that you must have. We are all servants, and it is through our service to our fellow man that we are fulfilled as a person. What a great place you and I are placed in to be servants in a medical capacity. You have the ability to help people in such a special way, and it thrills me down to my toes to be able to help you to do that. Now, since you have a hunger and a need to serve others, you need to be more productive in order to better serve your clients, your family, and your community. Now, in the quote from Mr. Disney earlier, he speaks of duty, which in the dictionary is defined as a responsibility, but more than that is a moral or legal obligation. Fewer people speak of duty anymore. Now, I found an interesting chart on the Internet of how many times the word duty is mentioned in books published since 1800, and it is a sloping downward curve. It is mentioned less and less in books, which books are just a reflection of society. It is interesting that since 1990, this downward slope levels off, and since the year 2000, it slopes gradually upward. I will place a picture of this graph in this post. That way you can see what I'm talking about. Now, nowhere since 1840 does this graph go up at all. So to me, this speaks of hope for the recent upward trend since the year 2000 of the mention of the word duty. Now, why do I speak of the word duty? I believe that if you are in the service business, like you and I are, especially the business of helping people physically, then you and I have a duty, a moral obligation, to be as unselfish as possible when performing our duties. We need to prioritize our duties. My priorities are first God, family, then friends, and then my business. This is a framework that if you get right and work off of, then I know you will be successful. And you might say, yeah, Scott, how does this duty get me more clients? Now, I would say, first of all, that's a selfish statement, and we're working on being unselfish. We need to shift our perspective. How can you better serve the clients that you have right now? Of course, we all want practical and actionable tools and tips to acquire more clients, but always keep in the front of your mind that you are here on this earth to serve, and it is through unselfish service that you will be fulfilled as a person. Unselfish service is how we have joy and purpose. So with that, I want to also give you some practical tips and tools. So here we go. Leonardo da Vinci once said, Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Your productivity tools, the way you approach your business, should be as simple as possible. Whenever I put a new system in place, or what you might call an operating procedure, I set it up first. And then I tell myself, how do I make it more simple? Boil it down to its simplest parts. A great way to do that is try to explain it to somebody else. Here's the new system I set up. Let me explain it to you. Take their questions, implement those changes, and make it more simple. The most important productivity tool that I can tell you about is your schedule. Sure, you must have a to-do list, but we're talking about scheduling your time. Don't schedule specific tasks like call so-and-so 
but schedule rather blocks of time set aside for tasks such as check email, treat clients, work on marketing, time with family. You must absolutely have a tangible schedule, something that you can look at, something that is there that you can refer to and change and work on. I use Google Calendar for my scheduling, which I highly recommend. But whether you're using Google Calendar or not, you must have a tangible schedule. Right now, my blocks of time on my Google Calendar include such things as billing. For a chunk of time, I work on billing. Website. Right now, I'm working on my clinic website, so I need a chunk of time to work on that. I have a block of time just titled Spreadsheet. I have a master spreadsheet. You can check that out on the website. I offer that for free. But that way, I can track all of my clients when their prescriptions are due, when their evaluations are due, and other things like that. So I have a master spreadsheet, and that's what that refers to. I have blocks of time of treatment. I have a block of time to produce this podcast. Now, in this schedule, I don't have to-do list. It's more of time set aside in order to work on an overall project. I remember watching an old movie called Cheaper by the Dozen. Now, there is a newer version of this, but I'm talking about the old black and white one. In this movie, there are multiple kids, which probably appealed to me for that reason. But the dad was some sort of engineer. His job was figuring out different systems for businesses. So he would time himself doing certain activities. I remember one scene in here. He asked his wife to time him while he would button his shirt to see if it was faster to button going from top to bottom or from bottom to up. This should be our attitude. This should be how we think about things. Is it faster to do it this way or what if I did it that way? You should not be obsessive about it, but we should be doing more of it. Now, if you have a specific project that needs to get done, you especially need to schedule that. My wife and I put on my schedule a block of time when we were working on our ebook. I had a goal of getting it done in the spring because I especially like to go outdoors in the spring, work in the yard, work in the garden, go ride bikes and hiking. So I wanted to crank out this ebook during the winter cold months. We scheduled it and got it done. It took a little bit longer than we had anticipated. Stuff came up, and that's okay. Stuff's going to come up, but get it on a schedule. Make it tangible. Make it real. Now, while you're in work mode, you need to be very aware of time. That goes along with your blocks of time on your schedule. I use an app called Chime O'Clock. Now, what Chime O'Clock does, it's sort of like a cuckoo clock. You ever seen an old cuckoo clock? My grandma has an old cuckoo clock on the wall. At the top of the hour, the little bird pops out of his little window, and what does it do? Cuckoo, cuckoo. You know what time it is, and then it'll also chime however many times the actual time is. If it's 5 o'clock, it'll chime five times. But what chime o'clock does is you can set it to go off every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, or at the top of every hour, and it will just simply tell you what time it is. 11 o'clock. But wasn't that convenient? It just went off. Now, the little horn does not usually go off. That's a reminder that's coming up. It says the tree man's coming at 4 o'clock. He's going to cut some trees down for me. But it does say the time. 11 o'clock. Now that app is on iPhone. I'm sure there's an Android version of that also. Another scheduling must is to wake up early. Unless your private practice operates at night, you must start waking up earlier. Do this incrementally. Just do 10 minutes at a time. Wake up 10 minutes earlier tomorrow, and then for two weeks, continue to wake up that 10 minutes earlier. Then after that, wake up another 10 minutes earlier. Now what helped me do this? A couple things helped me with this. I started drinking coffee early in the morning. That helps. A little shot of caffeine. Another thing that helped was I started waking up for something that I like to do. I like to read articles in my Feedly feed, which is another productivity tip. Feedly, F-E-E-D-L-Y, Feedly.com is a way to aggregate posts and articles from websites. So I go to all the websites that I come across, and I really like that one. I copy that web link, and I post it in my Feedly feed. And then you can organize it by category. And it's just a great way to read all the great content on the Internet in one place. Of course, there's an iPhone and Android app for Feedly, so you can read it on the go. Sometimes I'll watch some short videos on the YouTube. I like doing that. So whatever motivates you to get up a little bit earlier, that is really going to make the difference when that alarm clock goes off early. Now, Monday through Thursday, I wake up at 4.15. The other days of the week, I let myself sleep until 5.00. Now, once you get used to that, it's hard to sleep past 5 o'clock, 5.30 anyway, for me, especially if the sun is up. If the sun wakes up before I do, I really start feeling guilty and that I've wasted part of the day. So get up earlier. You'll get more things done. 
Getting up earlier has allowed me to start exercising, which is a must. If you are not exercising, you must exercise. You must invest in yourself before you invest in anything else. Also, once you get used to waking up early, if you have a big project or something important that you need to get done, it is really easy to crank that out the first few hours of the day before anybody bothers you, emails you, texts you, asks you a question. You can really maximize your time in those early morning hours. Now, back to exercise. We all do better and are more motivated with a goal in mind. Exercise is no different. If you haven't been exercising regularly for a while, sign up for a 5K or a bike race or something. If you're not able to run, get bad knees, or something prevents you from doing that, find some sort of exercise activity and sign up for that, something that you have to work towards. It will keep you accountable. Choose an easy one at first. Give yourself plenty of time to work up to it. Don't sign up for a 5K next week if, if you have not been running. If you're doing private practice or interested in private, doing private practice, you must be even more serious about taking care of yourself. Exercise will be one of your best tools to deal with all that extra stress that you're going to have to deal with with owning a business. Exercise will greatly increase your productivity. Now, don't give me any excuses. I don't have time to do that. Scott, you don't know how busy my schedule is. Look, I got five kids. I run two therapy clinics. I have all the excuses I need to not exercise. When I was in basic training, my drill sergeant would come down on you like a ton of bricks. If he asked, why did you do that? If he asked me, Private Harmon, why did you do that? And then I came back with something silly like, Drill sergeant, that guy over there, he was doing He would cut you off. Private Harmon, no excuses. Drop and give me 20. Except he'd probably ask for like 75. But anyway, you get my point. There are no excuses. Now, along with exercise, you must drink lots of water, less Cokes, and less coffee. Cokes are horrible for you. Just stop drinking them. I haven't drank Coke probably in three years. Drink a lot of water. Most of the world's chronically dehydrated. Now, what does that do to your brain? You can't think straight. What does it do to your whole body? Chronic dehydration causes chronic and systemic inflammation, which is why most people are chronically sick or have heart problems, among some other health issues. So drink more water. You must hydrate. Now, this is interesting for me because I spend a lot of time behind a desk doing administrative type tasks, but drinking a lot of water requires me to go to the bathroom a little bit more. That's just the simple truth of it, isn't it? Now, my office is at the front of the building. The bathroom is at the back of the building. This makes me get off of my bum, for my British listeners, walk to the back of the building. At that point, I've got to say hi to all the therapists, some of the clients, interact with them in a positive way, show my face, answer any questions course use the bathroom and then I can go back to work don't tell me you don't have time to drink water because it makes you go to the bathroom all the time often that is a good thing otherwise I might stay at the front of the building all day in my office not talk to anybody that would be a bad thing now another great thing to do especially if you're doing some administrative type work for an extended period of time is that the top of every hour stand up and do 100 jumping jacks okay if you can't do 100 do 20 that extra blood flow to your brain will make you think better so when my chime o'clock goes off, 11 o'clock, it's time to do some jumping jacks. Now, speaking of administrative tasks, you need to recognize which tasks that you can delegate. You are doing some tasks that somebody else can do. Now, this is especially hard for me. And I know it's hard for you because each of us have what I call Superman syndrome. We're in private practice. We work for ourselves. We can do it all. Well, the simple truth is you can't do it all. And if you're trying to do it all, you're not doing it all very well. As your practice grows, this will especially be important. It'll be important to recognize those tasks that you need to delegate. If you're doing something that a minimum wage worker can do, let that person do it. And this will free you up to do more important things, to work on your clinic instead of in your clinic. It'll give you more free time to do marketing, to do treatment. Would you rather do something that someone else can do for $8 an hour and you can make $80 an hour doing treatment? That's a pretty good return on investment. Okay, the next item on the list here is virtue. Since you and I are in the service business, we must work on virtue. Stephen Covey, who writes many a business book, mentions this in some of the books that he writes. We best serve our clients by being unselfish. To constantly work on unselfishness, you must apply a tangible action to a behavior. Did you hear that? A tangible action to a desired behavior. Now, in order to teach my kids, my own personal kids, a behavior that I wanted them to exhibit, which... We'll just take, for example, I wanted them to learn to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. 
Yes, we still do that down here in the South. So I wanted them to learn to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, to an adult who they were around. How did I go about doing this? I went to the office supply store, and I bought a big roll of tickets. You've seen those tickets, like if you're going to do a raffle, and they give you a ticket and rip it off, and it has the number on the end. I got a big roll of tickets. That's the tangible item. For every time they said yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, they got a ticket. If they got enough tickets that week, then they got a treat, whether it be a candy bar or to watch a movie, something tangible. So you get my point, something tangible to affect a desired behavior. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret weapon to constantly work on selfishness or to be unselfish. This secret weapon is fasting. As I mentioned, Stephen Covey mentions this in his business books. Each of the major religions in the world teach the importance of fasting because they know how powerful it is to teach virtue. Now, my church just finished up Lent. We're in the Easter season right now, so I'm not doing any fasting. But during Lent, Christians will fast. No big secret, right? That's what we do during Lent. That fasting is supposed to work on a virtue. Often, we correlate fasting with food, which is so very powerful. You can also fast from activities that you like. A continual fast of a favorite food or activity will constantly work on selfishness. And being unselfish is the ultimate virtue. It covers all other virtues. And being unselfish will make you successful in your private practice. Now, another secret weapon in my tool belt, like the Batman of therapy here, is Evernote. Oh, I love Evernote. What is Evernote? Evernote is a, an application on your computer, on your smartphone, on your tablet. It allows you to take notes that you can categorize, enter on the go, and have everywhere. So think of Evernote as a large file cabinet. And within that file cabinet, there are notebooks. These notebooks are different categories or different ideas or different subjects. Each notebook, you can put multiple notes in there that pertain to that overall subject. Of course, this is all done digitally and is portable. Now, Evernote has a YouTube account, which is a great way to see how Evernote works. I'll put a link in the show notes to that. Also, to the Evernote website. It's evernote.com. Evernote says that they make modern life manageable by letting you easily collect and find everything that matters. Now, some things that I've done in Evernote is I've planned a vacation, wrote an ebook, keep a to-do list. I keep all of my passwords to all the websites that I visit in one note that is encrypted with a single password. I create notes for this podcast. I've taken a photo of my lawnmower parts so I can find them at the lawnmower store. There's so much more I have in my Evernote, but I think you get the idea. Another thing you can do in Evernote is you can share a note or a notebook. One way I used this was with a client that I was treating a 10-year-old child who was very smart, very tech-savvy. So they had an iPad, and I wanted this child to do some eye exercises and some motor coordination exercises, some strength exercises, so some different exercises I want this client to do. So I asked the mom if I could share a note on Evernote with her. We set that up. I made a checklist of exercises for days of the week that I wanted this client to do. That client then went into their Evernote on their iPad at home would check off the exercises as they did them. Then it would sync with my notebook, with my note, and I could go in there and see if that, see if he did that exercise. So he would arrive at the clinic for his treatment session, and I would ask him, hey, did you do your exercises? Oh, yeah, Mr. Scott, I did all those exercises. So I would take out my phone, bring up my Evernote note, and I would start looking at him. And I would say, well, you didn't do this one, and you didn't do this one. And, of course, then the excuses started. Oh, well, we, we had guitar practice and we had swim practice, which, of course, he did. He was a busy kid, so he really did try. It was a great way to keep up with exercises for both him and me. Now, another great way I use Evernote is I capture great ideas about my private practice, about the podcast, about life in general. I capture ideas because, you know, when you're out and about, that's when you come up with your best ideas. It's not when you're sitting at the computer. It's not when you're sitting there trying to come up with great ideas. It's when you're not trying to think about great ideas when they come to you. So, for example, I'm driving down the road going to the clinic, and I come up with a great idea. I'm listening to a different podcast or an audio book, and a great idea comes to me that applies to my private practice. How am I going to capture that? You know you got to capture it right then because when you get to the clinic or when you get home, you're going to forget it. Something else comes up. Capture these great ideas on the fly. Use Evernote to do it. So my iPhone has Evernote on there. You can either bring up the app if you're driving. 
The best way to do this is to call Siri, hold the button down, Siri comes on, open Evernote, Siri opens Evernote. Then you open the folder that you want that brilliant idea to go into. If you have an iPhone with Siri on there, then you hit the microphone button right by the space bar at the bottom. At that point, you can record your voice, so you just simply state your brilliant idea. Within Evernote, it will transcribe that audio into text in that note that you designated and your brilliant idea is captured. I love this feature of Evernote. You must start using this feature in Evernote, especially for marketing ideas. This is a great way to come up with marketing ideas and follow through with them because you're going to be driving around, you're going to be at the gym, you're going to be out at the hiking trail, or you're just going to be sitting reading a book and a great idea is going to come and you have to capture those at that very moment because you are a brilliant person. Now, if you don't have Siri or the way to transcribe notes within Evernote, you can use Dragon Dictation. It's an app. You can get it on your iPhone or your Android, and it's pretty good. I actually think a lot of times it's better than the iPhone version of transcribing dictation. So you simply talk into the Dragon Dictation app. It transcribes the text. You can copy it from there and then paste it wherever you want. Paste it into an Evernote note. Did I mention that Evernote will sync with any device I have it on? So if I dictate a note or I take a note on my phone, it appears on my desktop or my laptop, my iPad, or any tablet that I have my Evernote app on. It's brilliant. Evernote's free. There is a free version of it. I have a paid version because it holds more information, and I tend to max out my technology. So often I need to pay for the extra stuff. Another feature in Evernote is that it is searchable. So once you put your brilliant idea in there, you can search for that idea whether it's by a category or by the phrase itself. Another thing Evernote does is that if you take a picture of text, that it will transcribe that text, or it will at least be able to recognize that within a photograph, and you can search the text of that photograph. So I've done that with different books or different notes at a conference that I've been at, and I take notes you know, with your pencil, pad of paper. You can take a picture of it, put it in Evernote, and then it's searchable. That's amazing to me. You can search the text on that picture. You can also put voice memos in Evernote. That takes up a lot of space, though. And, of course, they're going to charge you for the premium space. Now, I also use a version of GTD. For those of you who don't know what GTD is, it's Getting Things Done. It's a book by David Allen on just that, Getting Things Done. There's a lot of great productivity books out there, but I'm going to recommend this one. Don't skip the others. But this is a good one to listen to on audiobook or just a half. The premise of it is you have different levels of importance of tasks that you need to do. So in Evernote, I have those levels of importance set up, and then I can follow through with them right there in Evernote. You can also set a reminder in Evernote to remind for an alarm to go off. And what I've discovered here recently is I like to have that physical sticky note. So when I get to the clinic, I'll go in my Evernote, in my getting things done, my GTD list, and I'll see what needs to be done today. I'll write it down on a physical sticky note right there by my computer, and that way is a constant reminder of what I'm supposed to be doing that day. At the end of the day, I can wad up the sticky note, throw it in the trash, which is super satisfying, or I can continue that sticky note on to the next day. If you're using Windows, it also has a digital version of sticky notes. Those are pretty good. I recommend those, but there's nothing like that physical sticky note, is there? The next item on my productivity list is to take a whole day off every week. Do nothing that day that is related to your private practice, to your business. Except if you need to take a short note on a moment of brilliance into Evernote, do that. You don't want to miss out on, the, on any brilliant ideas. But take a whole day, do nothing for your business. And the point is to not think about your business, not to think about your private practice. Do something totally different. Choose a day. If you're a Christian, the obvious day is Sunday. And what will happen is you will have moments of insight, of brilliance into your business because you're not thinking about your business. As I mentioned, harness those ideas, but take very minimal time to do so. Do not think any longer on them than just write them down. You are not working this day. You are off this day. You need to be doing something different the whole day. Something else that goes along with that is to get a hobby. You need to have your brain working in a whole different direction than business. Now, my kids take music lessons. Each of them plays piano, and they also play a stringed instrument. Of course, I wanted to be able to play with them, so I piddle, I dabble in guitar. 
Now that is totally different than doing private practice business. I also like to work outside in the garden. I like to work on my yard. It's totally different than running my business. It is often in those activities outside of my business where a moment of brilliance will come and I will think about something that I need to do, should do, and instead of trying to just push that away, I'll just harness it. I'll put it on a list and I'll say, there, it's there, I'm done with it. I don't have to think about it anymore. So get a hobby. I came across an article on Inc.com about why it's such a great reason to get a hobby for better work performance. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Another practical tip, if you have a website for your private practice, learn how to use Google Analytics. Then once you set that up, there's a mechanism in Google Analytics where it will email you a report once a week. That way you don't have to go look for it and it just comes to you. All right, we're going rapid fire here for a minute. If you're on a website, a spreadsheet, a PDF, whatever you're on on the computer, use the control F to find anything that you want to find on that page. I love control F. If I'm looking for a certain client's name amongst a bunch of names, control F, type the client's name in there. Boom, there it is. You need to use Siri more on your iPhone. I use it for a location-based reminder. So when I pull into my clinic, a reminder comes up for me to enter my mileage on my mileage app on my phone. I use Siri to do that. Hold the button down. Siri pops up. Remind me when I get to the clinic to do whatever that is I need to do. I also use an app called Vocal, V-O-C-A-L. It's a voice reminder app, and it is relentless. It will not let you ignore it. You simply open it up, record your message with your voice, set the day and time, and then it will come on on that day or that time and remind you in your voice what you needed to do at that time. It will remind you every minute on the minute if you choose to do so, and you will not be able to ignore it. So for important things, I will use the Vocal app reminder. I use a cloud storage system. I use Dropbox and Google Drive. These are great tools to be able to have your stuff anywhere. Now, I mentioned in my ebook, HIPAA Compliant Cloud Storage. And on page 121 of that ebook, I recommend Google Apps. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes here to Google Apps, which allows you to have access to Google Drive amongst the other Google Apps. Google last fall signed the HIPAA Compliant paperwork with the U.S. government. So that's why I recommend Google Apps right now. Now, learning. You need to be constantly learning about business, about marketing, about your niche in the therapy world. As I mentioned before, I listen to a lot of podcasts, to a lot of audiobooks, and I read a lot of material in my Feedly feed. One of the best tools I use in order to listen to audio is my Bluetooth earpiece. You've seen them. You've seen those people walking around the store with that little black thing in their ear. I don't do that. I don't walk around the store with that. That's silly. But I do use it in the car. You need to stop listening to silly talk radio. Talk radio is so depressing. You know that? You don't learn anything. You just get depressed because it's telling you how bad the world is. So stop listening to that. You'd be better off just listening to music. But you'd be better served than listening to more audiobooks about business, about philosophy, religion, anything but talk radio. My Bluetooth connects to my iPhone. I can listen to podcasts or any audio, audio books, and I am constantly learning. I have the opportunity to learn from brilliant people. You are a compilation of the five people that you hang out with. Well, if that's true, then I'm going to make one of those people or multiple people brilliant people who write books and produce podcasts. While you're listening to that brilliance through your Bluetooth earpiece, have your Evernote app open on your phone. Capture those brilliant ideas that you're going to get from those podcasts and those audiobooks. I signed up to listen to audiobooks at audible.com. It's a monthly fee. Amazon owns audible.com. And it allows me to listen to audiobooks at a rate faster than I could ever read these same books. I highly recommend audiobooks. You can go by my website and at the top, click on the learning resources tab. And I have a bunch of books that I recommend that you listen to about business, about marketing, and about all kinds of different things. I also have podcasts that I recommend in there you listen to. The next productivity tip is to write down the processes that you perform in your private practice. Write those down step by step, and then you can start video recording those from your computer. I use Camtasia. It's kind of a higher-end product, but you can also use Snagit. Snagit runs you about $50, and it allows you to capture 
the video and audio on your computer. And that way you can step by step demonstrate how you do a task in your private practice. This allows me to show my office workers how I want something done and they can refer to it multiple times. If I need to show my therapist a way to do notes or some other type of paperwork, I can create it one time. I don't have to explain it over and over and over again. Again, I'll put a link in the show notes to Snagit and Camtasia and some other screen capturing software. Next item, you need to get a checklist app. As I mentioned, I use Evernote. If you're using Google Calendar, they automatically put in there a task list in your calendar. It's pretty handy. Google Calendar can also sync to your iPhone or your Android phone. Email. Email is such a time suck, isn't it? You can get really sucked into doing some email. That is why on my schedule I have a block of time for my email. I do not go into my private practice, into my clinic, or I don't even wake up in the morning and the first thing I do is check email. Don't do that. That's bad. Schedule time in your day to check email. Do not leave your email open on your computer. Do not have a desktop notification of your email. Schedule it in your day, check it once or twice during the day, and then be done with it. Don't leave it open all day. Email is so distracting. There are a few tools for your email, for Gmail anyway. I like Gmail. I'm sure these tools or comparable tools are available with the email that you're using, but I like Gmail. And I like the ability to be able to schedule an email to go out, to be sent out. I do this with MX Hero. You can do it with Boomerang or Write Inbox for Gmail. And what you can do is you can write an email, schedule it to go out at a future date. Now, MX Hero is free. I think Boomerang and Write Inbox cost you a little bit of money. Now, if you did not want to give your email control over to a third party, there's a way to schedule Gmails using Google Sheets and Google Drive. And I'll put a link in the show notes on how to do that. There's another tool called Remio, R-E-M-I-O. The website is R-E-M-E dot I-O. And what it does is you can send yourself or send someone else an email at a future date. So that's kind of handy if you need to remind yourself at a future date, send yourself an email. There's a similar website called Hit Me Later, and it basically is a snooze for your email. So if you're like, oh, I can't look at that right now, send that to me later. Hit Me Later will do that. It's a free app. The free version is only up to 24 hours. In other words, you can. it has the ability to send you that email up to 24 hours later. There's a paid version where you can send that email to yourself up to one year later. Basically, what I do with that within Gmail is if I want to read it, but I want to come back to it later, I'll just click the button mark as unread. It just stays active in my important tab. I ask all of my therapist and the office worker to email me any requests or just bits of information they have on clients because if they verbally tell me and I don't write it down, I'm going to forget it. And then I end up asking them over and over, what about so-and-so? And they'll say, don't you remember I told you that? So I ask them to email me everything. If they start to tell me something specific about a client, I'll ask them to email it to me. That way, while I'm at my computer, I can go to the email, open it up, and then I can take that note on my spreadsheet about that bit of information. Another tool that you can check out is called IFTT, if this, then that. Now, this has the ability to create shortcuts, connections, and automatic triggers for all kinds of different things. So I'll put a link in the show notes to that. Now, with that, I think I better wrap this up. I've been going on for a while, but productivity excites me so much because if you have the right productivity and good productivity you can get more margin in your life you can get more stuff done and you can get the important stuff done you can focus on what is truly important in your life and what is important in your life is not busy work it's not paperwork it's helping other people It's, it's being unselfish in such a way that you are a servant to others which will ultimately fulfill you as a person so i thank you for listening today Remember, come by the website, startatherapypractice.com. Leave your comment, your tip, your productivity tip in the comment section. And if you do that, then you will be in the running to win a free copy of my ebook, Start and Run a Therapy Practice. So thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. You have been called forth to the summit of Mount Wanahakalugi to join with us in the fraternal bonds of tankhood. Huh? We want you in our club, kid. Really? From this moment on, you will now be known as Sharkbait. Sharkbait, hoo ha ha! Welcome, brother Sharkbait. Sharkbait, hoo ha ha! Enough of the Sharkbait. Sharkbait, ooh, bummer, but do.